book. We're going to go to page number. We're going to go to number 82. 82. We've got a, a family over here that's going to be uh, leaving us soon. To uh, He's taking his family uh, to another state. I believe it's Idaho. But uh, we wanted to kind of sing them a song to remind them of us out here. And, uh, and uh, hope the Lord blesses them out there right away. Get them going out there. Amen. Amen. All amen. right. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you. With his sheep secure, hold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet. stand in his family Amen. in the clouds or vacation time over here at a uh, blowout amen. Amen. amen amen we're gonna go ahead and go to number 211 211 in the red hymn books please glory to god i can hear my echo in here oh man <laughs> praise the lord amen Yes, good one. Hey, <laughs> the cross is standing fast. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Defying every blast. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The winds of heaven. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah. 
Go to number 210. Just flip the page over to the other ha other side right behind it. Oh, yeah. Oh. Amen. Amen. That was a uh, first song. First song was a uh, was a jalapeno, you know. Like uh, Brother Jay said during blow off. First song, jalapeno. By the time we got to the second song, we got a little uh, strong, stronger pepper. What is what is that one? The, no, no. Uh, this one. This one I'm expecting the ghost pepper right here. All right. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin, the new world begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified son. is all gone. Glory I'm saved. Glory I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. The angel rejoicing cause it is done. A child of the Father, join heir with the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Come on, church! Glory, I'm saved! Glory, I'm saved! My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Crucified one, saved by the blood of the crucified one. The Father, he spake, his will it was done. Great price of my part in his own precious son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. 
glory of saved, glory of saved, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone, glory of saved, glory of saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Here we go. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father. All hail to the Son. All hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory unsaved. Glory unsaved. My sins are all parted, my guilt is all gone. Glory I'm saved, glory I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Be saved. Can I ask, uh, ask brother... Brother Jesse, would you like to open this up in the prayer, please, brother? Prayer. Oh. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for gathering us on this beautiful Sunday. Yes, you, Lord. I pray for all the people that couldn't make it in church today. I hope their faith is still strong. Yes, Lord. Just like us here. And forgive us for all our sins. We all know that we all fall short. Thank you, Lord. That's right, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, church. All right, we're going to go ahead and pull out the white hymnals. My hymnals, and we're going to go to number 68. Number 68, please. What a day that will be. What a day. Today, please. Amen. Yeah, today, even so, even so. Don't go to Idaho. We're going up two piles. Yeah, amen. Ming a day. When no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be! What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see And I look upon His face The one who saved me by His grace Then He takes me by the hand Lead me through me. What a day Glorious day That will be Amen oh, I thought we were ghost peppered up there. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen, sisters. Amen, church. All right. I'd like to ask Brother Tom to come up here. First things foremost, most important thing, uh, Brother Ralph, if you don't mind uh, passing out these newcomer cards. If you're new to a church, if you're visiting, please raise your hand. Brother Ralph is going to give you a little card. Just so we can pray for you. We have your contact information and we can encourage you. Thank you so much. God bless you for attending our church. We all know how many other places we can be on Sunday morning, whether it's the Super Bowl or baseball or whatever. I don't even know when Super Bowl is, by the way, so uh, forgive me for that. But at whatever sports event you can be, you choose to be here. So praise the Lord. We had about a special blessing today. We had 16 people attending street street preaching this morning. The gospel was preached on three of four corners. So by the end of this year, maybe we'll have four of all four corners preached on. Amen. So thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, here we have the volunteer sheets. Um, um, 
you would like to volunteer for a church, God bless you. Thank you so much for every one of you who is volunteering. Again, as every week, we're in dire need of people bringing food. Uh, I signed up for two weeks. Uh, but thank you so much for volunteering. But we are in need of people bringing food. So if you could do that, God bless you. It'd be awesome. Uh, please let me know. I know most of you have been very good about this. Please let me know if you're unable to make it. Thank you for those who, are, who have already let me know and have switched some dates around. God bless you for that. Thank you for keeping on top of it. Appreciate that quite a bit. So we have a couple interesting announcements today. So for those of you who said you were going to come or summer camp, uh, please let us know, or not let us know, but give us the fee today. We need the fee today, okay? Today was the deadline as I announced last week. It's the fee of $225. Please give it to Mr. Sean, who's, gonna, who's our treasurer. So he'll take care of that. So please hand over all summer camp fees due today, $225 to Brother Sean. Uh, let's see here. So this week we had street preaching. So next week will be visitation at 10 a.m. We're going to have visitation at, at 3012 Humboldt Avenue in Santa Clara. So those of you who can make it, God bless you. We're going to go knock on some doors, and I don't know, maybe we'll get yelled at. Who knows? <laughs> we didn't get any, any yelling this morning, but we got some uh, engines running. So that was good, good news. Uh, this week we're actually, we actually have the bulletin, so we're going to have review. Uh, let's just go through the verses again. Galatians chapter 5. Um, this is our review verse for this week, Galatians chapter 5, and we're reviewing verses 9 through 10. I know verse 9 is extremely popular. I'm sure if you've been in our church for at least a couple weeks, you've probably heard this somewhere. Sean was probably poking, a, poking fun at one of us and saying this verse. Galatians chapter 5, and these are verses 9 through 10. Uh, so far, actually, this year, we're going to have a lot memorized if we kept up with everything, <clears throat> everything this year. I apologize for the hoarse voice. I, I was also yelling this morning at the corner, so bear with me a little here. Um, so the Bible says, Galatians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, it says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will, no, you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. It's a little scary, amen? <laughs> so don't be mean to your brothers. Be nice to your brethren, okay? Um, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You're going to see Sean quoting that all the time. Oh, yeah, you're the leaven, aren't you? <laughs> so he'll, he'll poke fun at you every now and then. So these are awesome verses, and now we're going to go through our bulletin. We have, a, we have a new bulletin out this week. I'll be sending it out tonight. I promise it will actually be tonight, not Monday night. So stay tuned for the bulletin. So let me announce what's been going on. This month, we passed out 82 tracks. I know we probably passed out more than that, but some of you, I think, forgot to mention it to me. So, so far, on uh, as for sure, we have passed out eight, 82 tracks. I'm not. I'm pretty sure we didn't have any Bibles taken. Nobody's told me that yet. Um, so this month, we've had 803,000 views, 3,302 subscribers, 16,088 shares, and 5,463 comments. And lo and behold, we had 12 souls led to Christ this month alone. That's, if I can do the math right, that's around, that's almost 40% of the souls we won so far this entire year. That's a lot of souls just this month. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, so many attendees, we've had, we had 16 people this morning, but I couldn't log that for this bulletin because it was this morning. So I'm going to put it in the next bulletin. Uh, I think last month, we, the last, most we've had was about eight members, which is still good. Uh, we're averaging about that much. So praise the Lord for that. Other fruits, we've had lots of souls won to Christ this month. That's, I think, our biggest Amen. other fruit so far. That's 12 people that we're going to get to call brethren up there. Amen. So that's, that's a big deal. And, you know, many people pitched in to send tracts over to Liberia. I know some of you, I've, I've informed, we've sent some tracts over to Liberia to a native evangelist over there. So I'll keep, keep you guys posted on what's going on with that stuff. So that was another fruit of ours. It's, it's a, it was a blessing because a lot of people pitched in to send them over there. So God bless you for pitching in. So for next month, we have our memory verses on the first page. We have all of these here. We reviewed verses, uh, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to go through the whole chapter. So we reviewed verses 9 through 10, and it's going to go, what's going on? Oh, is it not? Is it better? Okay. I hope you guys can hear me online. Praise the Lord. Uh, okay. So, so next week, we're going to do 11 through 12, 13 through 14, and 15 through 16 for the, ahem, let me, for the last week. I think that's, that's nice, nice to go now. Um, so that's going to be our memory verses for this month. It's going to be awesome. If t an average of 10 members of our church have been, 
uh, keeping up with everything so far, an average of 10 members would have read, guess what, five twelfths of their Bible. An average of 10 members would have spent nearly 20 hours winning lost souls. Um, San Jose Bible Baptist Church would have prayed nearly 350 hours for God to save lost souls, meet the needs of fellow Christians, support over 50 ministers and ministries. We have more than 50, I think. There's a lot. And so much more. We would have passed out over 4,200 tracts, and we have already led 40 souls to salvation so far. And provided that we all kept up with our memory, memory verses, we would have memorized two chapters and 10 verses already. That's a lot. And those chapters were not short. Um, so we also had lots of lots and lots of prayer requests. Um, here's our, as usual, we have our little Bible reading schedule here, and it continues on for weeks one, two, three, and four. They're on, on the next page. We have our Bible reading schedule, if you're keeping up with it. Um, a little addendum here. We have a fifth week this month, and I hate it when that happens because I have to do this. So the fifth week's reading schedule is down here, and the totals are on the on this side here. I, yeah, on the left. No, but it's on the right side of the paper. Sorry. Okay. So totals are down here. Now we're going to have a little special from uh, our very own brother, Brent. Thank you, sir. Let's lift his name up. Sort of dedication. How many of you are familiar with this song? I don't know if it's sung here, but it is a well-known song of the, the Christian repertoire. And so the words are good. Number 314. I am thine, looking at the first verse, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. And then first drawn to the And as some of you are aware, we do have reduced sonic resources here with our keyboards. So I am going to, if, if it, it feels like I'm searching a bit at times, hopefully it won't do much. But that's because I'm trying to condense it into what we have available here. So we love you. Come on, brother. All right.
Usually our offerings go up when Stan is involved in offering. So I'm going to miss that intimidating face, amen. I'm going to miss that intimidating face. All right, Brother Stan, would you do your last prayer for the church for us? Father, thank you so much for Calvary, Lord. Thank you so much for the blood. I believe the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's forgiveness of my sins and sins yes. of my brothers and sisters. Lord, thank you so much for this church. If it had not been for this church, I know where would I would be or my family. Thank you, Lord. All these people, Lord. Thank you so much for Pastor. Thank you so much for this church, brothers and sisters. Lord, we are your fellow solo soldiers, and I know some of us, we can go to the field and we fight. Some of us, we provide food, armors, ammunition. Mm -hmm. Lord, we know that every penny is, every penny is important, and every mm -hmm. penny goes to you for your work. That's and right. Your glory, Lord, and I pray for, we know that we, we should give. We should not give not grudgingly or out of necessity. Amen. It's not about the amount of money we give. It's about our heart and how much we give. And it might be nothing. It depends on uh, how you prosper. Lord, and thank you so much for everything you have done to me and go to this church. And please bless this service. And but, uh, don't let Satan hinder. And Amen. Oh, that's good. Let Pastor preach. Let Pastor preach boldly and preach what he has prepared on Lord. Take over him and let you preach, Lord. That's good. Psalms chapter 40, verse 5, please. Psalms chapter 40, verse 5. I have preached this sermon before, but the Lord laid it upon my heart to preach again for some weird reason. This sermon has... It, this sermon, it's not the sermon that I noticed that has been a blessing to the people, but more particularly to me, actually. So, which is kind of strange, because I think the Lord deliberately did it for me. So this sermon is actually more applied to me than to you. But if it applies to you in some way, I hope that it will be a blessing to you. This sermon was literally the sermon that saved my life. This was the sermon that kept me going on for Jesus Christ and to not quit. This was the sermon that prevented me from getting into the world and into sin. This was the sermon that made me see there was something higher as the prize, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ, which was why I was willing to lay it all. And this is a sermon that I will repeat again, because I believe the Lord laid it upon my heart to do so. Psalms chapter 40, verse 5, the psalmist says right here, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You must understand that God, what he has done in your life to bless your life, is much more than you can ever count in your entire lifetime. Even the imaginations that you would think or even dream about desiring, God provides you even more. And this sermon, I hope, will help those who are ready to quit. This sermon will help those who seek after the world rather than God. This sermon will help those who are struggling with their everyday life issues and feel like there might be something worth more out there. This sermon may be for specific ministers who feel like that there's a better life out there. But let me tell you something. There is no better life than you are living right now in God's ways. And I am going to prove it in this sermon because I am going to prove to you that God's blessings are far bigger than any number that you can count. Yeah, that's right. And I'm going to challenge anybody out there, anybody out there who is powerful or who is famous 
or who is rich or who can grab anything of this world's desires that they can never, that they can never have these following blessings that I'm going to point out to you from the scripture. Today, my title is Bigger Than Billions. Bigger Than Billions. Let's pray. Father God, please wash away my sins with your precious and most holy blood and fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Every Sunday, Lord, I don't know why, I always feel empty. I always feel hopeless and I feel powerless. And maybe that's your way of teaching my flesh to always remember its humble beginnings. So I thank you so much for that. So God, all I can do is rely on your power now and please fill within my mouth the right words you want me to say. And Lord, I know that the many times I preach this sermon, it has not been a special blessing to people because it did not aim a particular area in their life. But it did for me, Lord. And I thank you so much for giving me this sermon for my life. So perhaps today I'll be preaching more at Gene Kim. But there might be somebody out there who this sermon might help. And I pray that you'll speak to them, Lord, today. Speak to them, Lord. Dear Lord God, the internet spoke too much to them. The television spoke too much to them. The music of this world spoke too much to them. The bleeping of the car spoke too much to them. The rambling of the workplace spoke too much for them. The squabbles within the household has spoke too much to them. Dear Lord God, the world has spoken much too much to them. They need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I am going to enjoy myself today. My first point is rewards from heaven. Rewards from heaven. Now the first thing you must understand why God's rewards are far greater than any other reward you can seek in this life is because of heaven itself. And you don't know what you're missing out on. Sometimes some of you might say, well, I wish I wasn't a saved Christian. I wish that I was seeking after the world. Why did I end up in this church when I can go to bigger churches out there? Why is it that I'm going through this particular trial or this particular suffering? Life is unfair. I wish I can have it better. But my friend, you don't realize that becoming a saved, Bible-believing Christian who's living according to the will of God is far better than anything else that you can imagine in your life. The rewards from heaven are, make it far more innumerable. Like what, for example? What, for example? What, for example? I know the first thing that's on your mind for some of you who are living right. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 24 says, The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. I'll tell you the first thing why. I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to hell. That's why. Because I've been saved from the damnation of hell itself. And that's why there is joy in my soul. What do you mean that you want to be like some of these celebrities? You want to be like some of these lost people or your lost friends? You want to burn in hell like they do? That's the greatest thing in life. That's the greatest thing of being a saved Christian is that you don't have to burn in hell for all eternity. My friend, I was that person. Can't you remember your past life where you were a nobody, where you were wicked, where you've taken God's name in vain? You served nobody but yourself. The God that you served was M-E, me. That was the God you served. And all your life you lived in sin. All your life you lived in wrong doctrine. All your life you didn't know what was right and what was wrong. All your life you heard about Jesus or Christianity, but you didn't know the real Jesus. You didn't know real Christianity. And for some weird reason, one day the Lord, he just sent in someone in your life who opened up that King James Bible and showed you from the word of God how to be saved from the damnation from hell. And you, out of the humble and repentant heart, all you did was God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Save my soul from hell. That's the reason why you should shout. That's the reason why you should be happy. Because the greatest reward that anyone can ask for in life is to be saved from the damnation of hell. You can have all this world, but the world will burn to the ground and you will burn along with it. And where's your joy? It's burning. It's burning. That's the reason why I wish that those lost people are living more happy lives than me right now. I honestly mean that. You might say, why is that, preacher? Because this is their best life now. This is their best joy that they can ever taste. 
for me, this is the worst life now. Not too bad for my worst life so far. And guess what? It's going to get better and better because my soul is saved from hell. You're not happy you're saved from hell? You're not happy that you're saved from hell. Jesus Christ saved your soul from hell. John chapter 14 verse 6 told you where Jesus Christ proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that was that way of life that you took that you may depart from hell beneath. You know what the second reward is? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Second reward is that you don't have to work. Praise God that I'm a saved Christian, that I don't have to worry about, man, I sinned again. Oh man, I've taken Jesus' name again. Oh, did I commit the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Oh, man, I didn't get baptized yet. You got to baptize me right now, Pastor, so that I can be saved from hell. Oh, no, it's late. Uh, you know, we'll set up an appointment later. Oh, I can't do that. No, I need to get baptized right now. Do you see the thief on the cross saying that to Jesus? Oh, Jesus, baptize me right now, please. Get me out of this cross. You don't know that Jesus Christ, all he said was, by faith, believe Trust, it's faith, it's not by baptism, it's not by works, it's not by church membership, it is not by keeping the commandments, it is not by observing the Levitical laws, it is not keeping the Sabbath or a Sunday, it is not by putting on your Sunday best to come to church, it is not by doing any sort of good work, you can follow all the sacraments to a T, you can follow the golden rule to a T, you can observe the Sermon on the Mount to a T, but those things, will never save your soul from hell because I dare you give me your best work hit me with your best shot man give me your best work well you know I prayed five times a day on this Muslim mat and then I prayed and I faced toward Mecca I prayed so much more than you you know what my work is you're looking at Jesus Christ hanging on the cross top that boy I dare you bring up any good work and it will be folly at the foot of Jesus Christ. Amen. Filthy rags are works. The Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And that's the reason why I can thank God that I don't have to work for it. I don't have to worry about my salvation. I don't have to think about, man, I got to do all these works and efforts. Do you not realize, friend, that for thousands of years, the Old Testament saints had to find every sheep that would bow around so that they can offer the sheep as an atonement and forgiveness of sins. My friend, thank God that you and I don't have to... We don't have to attend every service to bring a bleeding sheep to sacrifice for our sins. Thank God that we don't have to confess to some person that we feel uncomfortable to and confess our sin and pretend that we get forgiveness of sins by saying five Hail Marys or 30. Thank God that all we had to do was one time, in one shot, in one place, anytime, anywhere, any place where the Lord Jesus Christ said, here I am, my child. I paid it all for you. Thank God. He paid it in full. So you don't have to pay extra. Well, let me just give a one more sacrament at the end. No, no extra. Jesus paid it all. He paid it in full. Man, we are in a blessed dispensation. Thank God we don't have to work for our salvation. In the Old Testament, they had to do so many things by observing the law. My friend, as you read Numbers and Leviticus, your heart would sink on what you have to observe for your salvation. But Jesus Christ fulfilled every verse in Numbers, Leviticus, and Exodus, and he took the death penalty in your place. So I did not have to die for my sins. I could have been the one stoned to death. But Jesus Christ took the penalty of death for my place. Worked it all. That's why he came to fulfill the law and he fulfilled it on my behalf. So if I'm a Seventh-day Adventist after this, if I'm a black Hebrew Israelite after this, if I'm a Hebrew Roots Movement after this, if I remain a Judaizer after this, then I have lost my faith in Jesus Christ who paid the work everything for me. 
He kept the commandment. He kept the law. I didn't have to do a thing. These Muslims and these Catholics and all these religions, they would get mad at us and say, you Baptists are so lazy. You don't have to work a dime. You don't have to do anything like that to get to heaven. And I just feel like saying to, I just feel like running the aisles after they say that. I go, well, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You're right. I got off. I became, I got lazy I, because someone paid my debt, gave me the free gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord. That's a great testimony, Mr. Muslim sir. Say it again, please. Thank God, man. He did all the works for me. My third reward is eternal security. Ephesians 1, verse 13, and chapter 4, verse 30, it says, In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, up to a certain point until you commit the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. Sealed, Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed Amen. unto the day of redemption. Yeah. Oh man, pastor, I sinned again, and oh man, am I going to burn in hell? Is the Holy, I still see the Holy Spirit in there. You can't go to hell even if you wanted to. Oh man, I hurt the Holy Spirit again. I grieved my Savior again. I crucified him again. I nailed him on the cross with my sin again. Oh God, forgive me. Oh God, I'm wicked. Oh God, I can't help myself. You know what? I'm an addict and I can't give up this sexual sin. I can't give up this alcohol. I can't give up my cigarette addiction. Oh God, God. I'm a hopeless drunk, and I'm going to be a forever damned reprobate. This homosexuality that I'm struggling with, these kind of sins I'm struggling with, oh God, I'm hopeless, I'm reprobate, I'm lost. My friend, the Holy Spirit sealed you till the day of the redemption. Man, you can't go to hell even if you wanted to. I dare you to break the seal of the Holy Spirit. You can even if you wanted to. You became elect. At that point, God became a Calvinist and said, Yeah, you can't go to hell even if you wanted to, child. You are predestinated. You are eternally secured. You are locked and you are secured up to glory. Thank God that I know that I'm going to be raptured before the tribulation. I know that my sin is not going to be great enough to put me in hell. I know that my iniquity is never greater than the grace of God. I am eternally secured. So if you're still worried about, man, am I really saved? Am I really saved? Start tasting your reward today and don't waste it. You know what Satan wants to rob you of? He wants to rob you of that reward of not burning in hell because Satan is worried every day, I'm going to burn in hell. I'm going to burn in hell. I wanna bur I'm going to burn in hell. And Satan, he wants you to be as worried as he is. Boy, he didn't like hearing that today. God, protect me. I need your special shield today, Lord. You know what thing you got over the devil is that whatever sin you commit, you're never going to share the same hell with him. Amen. He'll be down and you'll go up. Amen. Eternally secured. Bless God. Hallelujah, man. And my fourth reward. And you don't think that, you don't think that being a saved Christian is that great now, huh? I'm on reward number four, man. Reward number four, man. Imputation. Bless God, man. Romans chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute Amen. sin. Amen. Praise the Lord. Imputation. You might say, what is imputation, pastor? Look at discipleship videos. Did you forget? Imputation. It means right here that God, he does not count sin in you. So even though you have sin in you, God's just not going to count sin in you. He's just going to ignore it. Praise the Lord. Your sins are covered. God does not see sin in you. Can you imagine that day in and day out that as you sin every day and as you commit the same habitual sin over and over again, you feel guilty about? You skip Sunday church again. You skip your Bible reading again. You skip soul winning again. You skip prayer again. You fail to be a good husband, a good father. You fail to be a good wife and a good mother. You fail 
fail to be a good son or a good daughter, a good brother or sister, or even a good brother and sister in this church. You failed and you failed and Satan, he's just keeping tabs of every sin that you've done so that he can wring his hands on you and bring it to the throne of glory and say, let me have him, God. Let me have him. Don't you see right there? Your child, he skipped church again and he expects to have a good pay in his workplace. He expects to get home safe in his car without getting any accident. He expects that he can breathe the next day blaspheming you, rebelling against you, and thinking that he can come back to church. Everything's all right. God, let me strike him now. Here's a list. And God says, I don't see anything right there. And then the devil says, do you need glasses, Jesus? Look at this. Look at this. And God says, I cannot see sin no matter how hard I try because all I see is a sacrifice of my son who already took the sins of all of mankind. Praise God. Amen. Man, bless God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, man. Man, Pastor, you're so pumped up today. Yeah, leave me alone, okay? Leave me alone. I want to stay pumped up, man. I am glad that he gave me imputation. And that's the reason why. Thank you, Father God. You did not strike me dead on this pulpit. You kept using me to preach your word. You know why? He does not see sin in me. He does not see sin in here. Oh, man, this just gets better. My fifth reward is sanctification right here. And these are all just the rewards from heaven, man. Just from the rewards from heaven. Sanctification. Man, bless God, not only did he not see sin in me, but he separated me from sin into holiness. And that makes me even more happy. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's one thing God does not see sin in me, but that he calls me holy, yeah. that he calls me pure and sinless. You don't believe me? Did you read the Bible where it talks about holy brethren, holy apostles? You think they were holy? No, they were not. But you know what God was looking at? He did not count sin in them, and he had to put them in holiness. Do you know why? Jesus not only took my sin, he gave up his holiness and gave it to me. He gave it to me, and I am considered holy. Bless God, glory to God, ten years ago. You didn't have a thought about taking God's name in vain. And now all you can use is his name, not in vain, to glorify him 10 years ago. God separated you from sin unto holiness. Look at you back then. You are dressed up like the world. And who are you now? You come in in your Sunday best. People think you're strange. You're weird. Bless God. Don't bring me back to the world. I'll stay here as long as I can. Bless God. Glory to God. You are the one shouting at a Sunday football game. And now you're shouting in a church service. Bless God. Glory to God. You're the one who spent your passion spending hours, spending hours studying the dry books of school, working hard at your workplace. And now you're wasting your time coming to a church service, hearing some guy talk about Jesus Christ. What kind of a weirdo are you? Bless God, 10 years ago, what were you back then? You told yourself, you told yourself from today to the you 10 years ago, hey man, didn't you know that you're gonna be knocking on that person's door right there you just passed by and you're gonna ask him if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? Oh, you nuts. Didn't you know that one day that you're gonna go to some kind of weird little Korean over there at the middle of no man's land at a liberal area and you're gonna be happy and you're gonna be fellowshipping and serving God? Oh yeah, sure, no, I, I like my friends over here. What are you talking about? Man, can you imagine the you from today telling yourself 10 years ago, yeah, you better keep smoking up that cigarette, man. One day you're going to put that down. One day that you're going to put that bottle down. One day that music you're listening to, yeah, you love it, but one day you're going to despise it. And you're going to be singing these old-fashioned hymns. Hey, let me play a sample for you and see if you get a blessing out of that. What, are you kidding me? Me? I'm not going to love how great thou art. That's too dry and boring for me. Bless God, he changed your life. Man, thank God. Don't take me back 10 years ago. Can I get an amen from somebody who was 10 years ago lost in sin? You don't want to go back there, do you? Door's out there. Walk out the door. 
Happy life to you, man. Bless God, man. Right here. I'll stay right here, man. And another blessing God has given to me is his love. His love. Reward number six. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. One of my favorite verses is that who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall life, nor death, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, no matter what I have done against him, he still loves me. John chapter 17, verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. Now, you, if this ain't a blessing, I don't know what is. What did Jesus say to God the Father? That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Can you imagine that? Jesus Christ, he said, Lord, as much as you love me, I want you to put that same love on Gene Kim. Oh, but he's, gonna bur he's a lost sinner. He's going to burn an L. He let me down. He's not like you, son. He's not the son that I can say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. No, it's you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, will you just give it to him, Father? The love that you gave to me, put it on him. And put on me the wrath instead as I hang on the cross. And when I cry to you, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ignore my cry, O Lord, and give your love to drink him. Thank God for his love, man. Can't you imagine that God, who is all-knowing, knows that after this church service that you're going to be the hypocrite that you are, that you're going to skip the church, you're going to skip the soul winning, you're going to go back to the sin, you're going to skip reading his word, skip prayer, and the all-knowing God, who knows what you're going to do, will still have to love you and say, I care for you. You who grieve, you who grieve the Holy Spirit of God, God in turn will never grieve you, but show his love towards you. You who betrayed the love of Jesus Christ. Christ, Jesus Christ says, my love will, ne will always stay faithful to you. You who cheated out on Jesus Christ, on spiritual adultery, Jesus Christ never cheated on you, not even one time. Thank God, man, for his love. His love is so great. And when you're suffering and when you're in pain and you feel like that you can be bitter and mad at God or life is unfair or the world is more attractable to you or that job opportunity or that money or that family life or whatever. And as you feel that pain and anger against God, remember this, while you're angry at God, Jesus sheds his love at you at that same time, that very moment. Every bitterness of every ounce of anger and bitterness, you, you just poured it on Jesus. Jesus poured an extra amount of love on you. Extra amount of care and mercy on you. Because he could have struck you dead for doubting and questioning and criticizing his holiness and his ways. But he shed extra mercy and love on you. Thank God for his love. Thank God that he loves me. You know what? He still loves me. He still loves me. My, the seventh reward is a home in heaven. Oh, bless God, man. And you just feel like running the aisles, man. Throw my shoes off after this. John chapter 14, verse 2 through 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. It's so amazing how many people waste their money, their time, and their schedule just to buy a house here in San Francisco right. Bay Area just to get a little plot of land that they can look and enjoy when God has given you a mansion up in glory.
That's why people, they have no choice but to go to a video game era or look at the television to escape their world into looking that awesome world and say, oh, if only I was there, only I can see it. That's the only way I can enjoy it is to just see it, is to just see it. My friend, you can stare at that flat screen all you want, but I'm going to be walking on it. I'm going to be living in it. I'm going to run around in it. And no matter how many miles per hour I fly around the place, I still got elbow room, man. That home in heaven is mine. That home in heaven is mine. And I said this before and I'll say it again. If you see my mansion up in heaven and you go, man, that's a nice mansion. You walk inside there. I'm going to push you away and say, get out of there. That's my house. Man, I got my own place, and God has given you your own place. He's given you a mansion up in heaven. What man hath the things that verse says, it doesn't matter what you think in your heart, what beautiful scenery or landscape that you prepare, you can put all the extra graphic arts there to make it more shiny, more beautiful. But my friend, God Almighty, he says it's going to be bigger than what you can imagine. That's right. What worlds, what realms will we enter? Seeing all the different colors of our world that we never saw before. We're going to be spreading throughout not just this earth, but throughout the whole universe itself and the heaven and the new Jerusalem. What a world. What a fantastic plane. Jesus, come quickly, please. And the eighth reward, oh, it just gets better and better. The eighth reward is the inheritance in heaven. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 34 says, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. What? Why would you be joyful take, stealing goods when you give up stuff to Paul? Because it says, Knowing in yourself that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Paul said, You know, all the sacrifice you gave to me and this ministry, you're actually spoiling yourself. Why? Because you're going to get things better up in heaven. Man, that one dollar bill is going to turn to pieces of gold up in glory, man. The inheritance, every ounce of suffering that you remember and that you feel and you feel like that. You know what? I'm going to bring it up to God up at the judgment and make him remember the pain that I felt. And trust me, God's going to remember the pain that you felt more than what you remember the pain that you felt. And God said, yep, I remember. I already remember. You think I'm stupid and dumb? Well, did you remember this pain you went through? Oh, no, I forgot that, God. Well, I remembered. And guess what? Boom, your inheritance. Amen. I pay it back Amen. to you. Man, every sweat drop, every tear drop, every blood that you shed, God has your piggy bank made up in heaven. Five, five different crowns. Crown of glory, crown of righteousness, crown of all these different things that God has provided to you. He has provided you gold, silver, and precious stones. He promised you a rulership of the cities of this world. And he promised you an inheritance of all things, whatever that means. But I'll tell you, if you look at 1 Corinthians 3, what all things is, Paul said, all things are yours, whether Paul or Cephas, things present, things future, this earth or up in glory, all are yours. And that's what happens when you serve Jesus Christ. When you serve your flesh, you're just building up one more green paper dollar bill. And you're just wasting your time when you should have spent that time using it for God in soul winning, in street preaching, in coming to church, in tithing, in reading the Bible, in praying, in avoiding sin. And you feel like, oh man, it's a pity that I can't do that, do that again because it's a sin. And the pastor says it's worldly. And what are you talking about, man? What you got up there is going to pay back even tenfold more. Man, you're not missing out anything. Uh -huh. Can I repeat that again? Yeah. Oh, I missed out. Oh, my friend's telling me what they've been doing, and I can't do that anymore. They have a nicer house than me, nicer job than me. I was doing this and that. You ain't missing out anything. Amen. I'll tell you one thing. Your Amen. friend missed out big time. This does not include the extra blessings in heaven that I could not name. God promised me no more sorrow. God promised me no more pain. God promised me no more sin. 
God promised me pure satisfaction. God promised me immortality. God promised me the rulership of kingdoms. God promised me perfect fellowship. God promised me heavenly food and heavenly creatures and animals. God promised me a superman body. God promised me the mind of Christ, which is smarter than any PhD that you're wasting your time on right now. God promised me fellowship with him face to face. Oh, Pastor Gene Kim, it's a pleasure to meet you. No, I meet Jesus Christ, man. Bigger than anything, man. Bless God and I'm going to have rewards from heaven. Bless God, man. I want Jesus to come right now. My second point. Wow, are you kidding me, Pastor? No, I ain't kidding you. Bigger than billions. Billions. My second point is rewards from here. Rewards from here. You understand that even in this life right now that God has blessed you with is something that a famous man, a powerful man, or a rich man can't ever have compared to a Christian who serves God. One is Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible says, But my God shall provide all your needs, supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God promised you that one reward, supplication of needs. Thank God that no matter how much your money is running out, or if your debts are getting higher, or you're worried about how to take care of your kids' tuition and your own family's future security, your retirement plans are all a jamble, and you're wondering, man, this church, how can it keep on going? What are we going to do? And you've seen your pastor trying to find a place which was pretty difficult, but you also seen that peace within him where he knows that God will take care of it. You know what? I've seen God providing my needs, supplying my needs, according to his riches. What do I have to worry about? Didn't you realize that Satan is robbing you of your reward right now with worry and fear and insecurity when all you had to do was just claim and taste the reward right now and sit down and just relax and say, God, you're going to have to handle everything and I'm going to have to trust in you. I can't do anything about it, Lord. So, Father, will you take care of me again? And God's going to look at you and say, yeah, you're an incapable loaf. I know that. So, because of that, I'll help you out, son. Man, the second reward is granting of wishes. It's not only my needs, what I exactly need, but even my desire. Of course, not every time God will meet your desires because it can be fleshy or something harmful. But you'd be surprised how much God has blessed you with more than you could have think of. Didn't, you, didn't, God, ha, didn't God bless your life more than just your needs at, when you look back at your life? Hasn't God answered you with things that you never even asked about but God just gave it to you anyway beyond your comprehension? And it's not exactly a need but a desire. God spoiled you rotten. John chapter 16 verse 24 says, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Man, you thought that the genie in a lamp, you only get three wishes, and that's something people will die for, and that people will fantasize and want. My friend, I got the power of prayer, and I can request over and over and over again. And my God says, well, you only got three wishes, so nope. Three strikes, you're out. No, God says, you didn't ask in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. And thank God. Another reward he promised me was victory. First John chapter 5, verse 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You got to realize that if you believed on Jesus Christ for salvation, you already won, man. That's the promise. Pastor, aren't you worried about these enemies attacking you online, or these trolls coming inside the church, or you know how these liberals and everyone in this community is stacked against you? What what the news media are talking about you. Aren't you afraid of getting arrested or persecuted? What they shut down your channel? What they close down your church? My friend, I already won, man. I already won. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. It's true, I may lose a battle now and then, but I've already won the war. You know what those losing battles are? Those are just tactics from God Almighty, letting the enemy have their due and 
rejoice for a moment and God just makes a comeback and stomps them rotten yeah, because he has a greater victory. That's why he says, you know what? You can take that little battle. You can take that little battle because I got a bigger one better. I got a bigger one better. And I'm going to crush you like there's no tomorrow. Why do I have to fear? We won, man. We won. What if you all run away from church after this? I'm still a winner, man. I'll start from scratch again. I know Jesus will take care of me. I know I'm going to come out on top. I won, man. So why do you have to fear? People think Christianity is boring, but it's actually very exciting. You know why? Thank God for these kind of battles here and there and these conflicts. Otherwise, there would be no dramatic story. Thank God. See, my life ain't boring. Yeah, Christian life may be difficult, but it ain't boring, man. If you think it's boring, you have not been in the battlefield. It ain't boring, man. I've seen those days where I thought that person wasn't going to get saved, and he or she got saved. There were days I thought that, man, Lord, how are you going to overcome this problem with my debts? And God just overcame it and took care of my debts. There was a time where I thought, Lord, I mean, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose my home, my finances, and God just secured my home. There was a time where the enemies of the Lord all stacked against me, and God just took care of all them in less than a season and I don't even have to parade or rub dirt on them on that because God already did it for me and those enemies know it Amen. see I already won my fourth reward is fellowship fellowship in Philemon 1 verse 20 it says yea brother let me have the joy of thee in the Lord refresh my bowels in the Lord the other reward God has blessed me with here was fellowship there is no other person that I would fellowship with than my brother and sister in Christ. Amen. There is also a saying that your greatest enemy can be saved. Bible-believing Christians like you. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing. To have a brother and sister in Christ, I would fellowship with that person more than any other lost person out in the world. I would rather fellowship with the person who believes in Jesus Christ for salvation. I would rather fellowship with the person who knows about cleanliness and sanctification. Who doesn't take, who don't take God's name in vain. Who uplift the King James Bible. Who believes in dispensational truth. Who believes in the old fashioned hymns. I would spend my time fellowshipping with the person than with any drug addicted substance abuser sexual minded God's name in vain taken lost person out there man I want to be in an environment that's clean I want to be in an environment that's truly my brother and sister in the Lord in the Lord my fifth reward is the presence of God the presence of God Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 and Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, Jesus said that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And man, thank God for that reward that in that moment when I'm by myself and I feel like no one can understand me, not even my brother or sister, not even my pastor, not even my husband or my wife or my son or my daughter or anyone else and I'm truly all alone and I can't say anything at all that Jesus Christ is sitting right there next to me and patting my head and saying, I'm right here, son. I'm right here, daughter. I'm right here for you. Thank God. He, you know, he could have just given me salvation. He didn't have to stay with this wicked body, knowing the things that it will hear, see, taste, and do, walk, and all, think. He didn't have to stay for that, but he stayed anyway. My, seventh re my sixth reward is all things work together for good at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Thank God that he didn't have to just take care of my needs or my desires, but even the bad things I go through, God promised I'm going to work it for good. Amen. Didn't you know that promise even includes the bad things that you messed up in? It's not just the good, it's even the bad. And that's the only verse in the Bible where God gave a positive promise that even if you messed up in something, He'll work it for good. How, how, how can my sinful habit work for good, Pastor? Well, t giving a testimony because there are plenty of brothers and sisters who are probably struggling with the same addiction like you. And they say, thank you so much for that testimony. That spoke to me. That helped me. That's how God used it for good. 
God can use anything for good. And I thank God for his promise. He didn't have to do that. All I deserved was judgment. All I deserved was justice. All I deserved was hell. And God said, I'm going to take those broken pieces that you shattered. And I'm going to take them back together and make it even a finer pottery than before. The, eighth re the seventh reward is the reward of sufferings. You might say, what? Are you kidding me? No, it is a reward. 2 Timothy 2.12 and James 1 verse 12, it says that by, by going through suffering, we gain greater blessing. You know what the reward is of suffering? So not only God promised that any bad thing we go through, he'll work it for good. But even the bad things, the pain that you went through, the suffering that you went through, God says he'll bless you for it. He'll bless you for it. Can you imagine that? Man, every pain that you remember that sleepless night and you feel like, I wish that there was some kind of relief. I wish that there was some kind of ease and comfort. Where is it when I want it? And God says, no, I'm not going to give it to you now because I have a greater blessing than that. I don't want to ruin the blessing. Let me give you a better blessing than that child. Thank God for the reward of sufferings. God didn't have to do that. All he had to do was just work it for good. That's it. But no, he'll even reward the pain that I felt and I went through. The eighth reward is his peace. That is something that no rich man can ever have, no matter how much money they have. More money brings more fear, more worry, more insecurity. John chapter 14, verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Can that heroin ever give you peace or just temporary high? Can that bottle ever give you peace? Can that lover you share your life with ever give you peace? Can that money ever bring you peace? Everyone's grabbing the peace of this world, but Jesus Christ says, the peace that I give unto you is not as this world giveth. The peace I give to you is unspeakable. You know what true peace is? True peace is not when you have all the money set up and you still worry but rather that there is no money at all and the trial and the fear start rising up, but you know that everything's still gonna be all right. So in other words, the powerful peace that you have is, let any bad thing happen to me, I'll still be good. Those rich people have to say, don't let anything bad happen to me so I can still be good. Now, what kind of peace can the world give to you, huh? After that, nothing. The ninth reward is his joy. John 15, verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You know, the blessed thing ever is that God promised to give you joy that will be full. And that is something that people don't understand. They confuse fun with joy. They confuse temporary relief with joy. They confuse the feeling of their flesh being happy with joy. That is not true joy. True joy is when I think about what God did for me at my past and will give to me in my future and even in the middle of my problem right now, I cannot help but live in joy every day. Now that's a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And you're going to realize at the end, ask every person who lives their life to the fullest at the end. They're going to come to realize that what good was all that, living my own life. But any Christian anticipates and is eager at the end of their life. Because they know when they look back at their life, they're going to go, man, what a full life I lived. A lot of trials, tears, and hardships. But wow, what golden memories I'll never forget. And I wouldn't trade for. And not only that, if that suffering didn't happen, I would not have experienced the joy and the blessing. Man, and what a life that I lived, Lord. What a good life. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready for my new life, Lord. That's true joy. This does not include the extra blessings that God rewarded you here when you serve him. 
God promised he wouldn't give you a burden greater than you can carry. God promised you grace for the hardship. God promised that the sufferings will turn out for your betterment. God promised you comfort during your sorrow. God promised you happiness after the tears. God promised his faithfulness to forgive your sin every single time. God gave you his promise of rest during the trial. God promised you his protection. God promised you knowledge of truth. God promised you that just forget your past. Just look at your future. Don't worry about that. God promised you earthly blessings that you didn't even ask for. What a God. My third point is rewards from himself. Rewards from himself. And I want you all to pay attention to this if you ever feel like backsliding. If you ever feel like I don't have to serve God as much. If you feel like falling into the world or quitting. If you compare all those rewards, see how they matter with your rewards from yourself. Living your life, your own life. The first reward, which is the best one if you live to yourself, the best one is temporary pleasure. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 25, it says pleasures of sin. There is pleasure in sin for a season. And that is the best you will ever have when you live for yourself. Oh man, I want a different job. I want a different new house. I want a different lifestyle. I want to get away from serving God. I want my own kind of living. Let me get back into worldly, the music, the dressing, the shows I watch, the videos that I play, the internet stuff that I do, the friends that I hang around with. Worldly, sinful. Let me enjoy a good time. I hate you preachers. Leave me alone. Well, I wish you the best, to be honest, because that's only temporary at best. Didn't you realize that even, even if you lived 80 years without a single ounce of discomfort, that that's still temporary? That's your best life. That's your best life. And that is the reward from yourself. But mine is where I go through the worst and it gets better and better. The second reward you get from yourself is no assurance after death. The Bible says, Revelation 21, verse 8, the fearful, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's why the rich and the elites and everybody else, they'll buy all the money, grab everything that they can, all the power, so that they can live a little longer. Who wants to die? There is no assurance after death. The, the craziest people you ever meet in this world who want to die early is saved Bible-believing Christians because they know that they got a better life up there because we got that much assurance. The third reward that you will get from yourself is failure of company. Job 19 verse 14 said, My kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. See, yeah, you want to hang around with that bunch that you hang around with, the worldly one, the lost one, the sinful one, because they're fun. They meet my character. They meet my kind of uh, way of doing things. But my friend, people, no matter how much that they can give you their love, they will still fail you. Can any of them pray for you? They can't do that much. And your safe friends can. Can any of them be there for you? Oh, they're there for me when I need their help. Every single time, every single minute. Or wasn't it Jesus Christ? You really think they can trust you? They trust you now because they like the way that you look or your character. But what happens when you lose half of your brain and your health is damaged? You think they'll visit you at the nursing home every single day? You think that they'll be there for you? They will help you and they will care for you? Or will it be Jesus Christ? Or will it be some brother and sister visiting you once in a while at the nursing home saying, hey, we've been praying for you again. The fourth reward you'll get from yourself is self-provision. Luke chapter 12, verse 29 through 30, it says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. See, you know what the reward from yourself is? Is what you work, you get. But here's my thing right here. When I fail, I still get. In fact, I gain the more through Jesus Christ. Here in this world, you have, 
You should worry if you don't do well in school. You should worry if you don't do well in your work. You should worry when your children are falling apart. Your family life is falling apart. You should worry when who's voted in the office or who's going to take over the world. You should worry. Me? Everything's all right in my father's house. That's the reward you get from yourself. The reward you get from yourself, fifthly, is sowing and reaping. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I promise you that every worldly, sinful, fleshy thing you sowed, you have to reap the consequences. That's a law, a law that cannot die. One day you're going to pay the piper, remember that. The sixth reward you get from yourself is denied of your request. Oh, so now you see, you finally pray to God when you're in trouble, huh? Not every day, not at church like you were supposed to. Now you pray to him, oh God, help me. No, God denies your prayer request. 1 John 3.22 says, if you keep his commandments, do those things that are pleasing in his sight, then he'll answer what you ask. The seventh reward you get from you is no answer for sorrow. Psalms 38 verse 17 shows my sorrow is continually before me. You know what happens when you live for yourself? You are only happy when you have the happy moment. But when the sad moment comes, what, where's your happiness? Where's your answer? The eighth reward you get from yourself is a tragic end. Psalms 31 verse 10 shows my life is spent with grief, my years with sighing. See, all these rich big shots, all these big people when they die, can they honestly say, at the end of their life, what a happy life that I lived. Why do you think a lot of these people are trying to do, Philip, these people are trying to do charitable works? It's as if they want to leave something behind. They don't want to go yet. Me, when I, if you live for Jesus Christ, you know you can die happy. You feel like I fought a good fight. I finished my part. But if you have been backsliding, if you have not been living right with God, what if the rapture were to sound right now or if you were to die on your deathbed? Will it be regret? The last part, which is the worst reward that you will get from yourself, is wrath or terror. Revelation chapter 14 verse 10 shows that if you live to yourself as a lost person, you're going to get God's wrath in hell. If you live for yourself as a saved Christian, God promised you terror at the judgment seat of Christ. What a day, man. What a day. Do you want to live at that day? You want to live at that day? That is the worst thing you'll ever have. See, I think this one is alone sufficient why you should not live for yourself. Is God's wrath in hell or his terror at the judgment? That's why... I would come to this church. I would be a fanatic. I would gladly lay down my life for Jesus. No matter how many tears or hardships I go through, I do not quit. You know why? Because I realize why give up what God has blessed me with and waste it all. There is no better life than what I have right now. That's why this sermon was the one sermon that kept me going today. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. I don't know if, you're, if you won't give your life to Jesus or if you feel like throwing in the towel. I don't know, maybe some of you young people or even you grown adults, you want to live your own life, right? You don't want to live the Christian life. You're wasting, you're wasting your life. You're wasting his blessing. But I really love what I got now. I'm so comfortable with what I have now. Then I wish you the best because that will only be temporary, remember? And not only that, I know. I know for a fact some of you are already suffering the consequences of your sin right now. The consequences of your flesh. I know that. And you're like, man, this is not really it. And now you know what it became your life? Your life? that you want to stubbornly cling on to became a miserable drug addiction. That's what it's become now. It's giving you misery and pain, but you're still clinging on to it because it feels good. It feels comfortable. No, no greater life than Jesus Christ. 
If you are not saved in Jesus Christ, then today is a great time for you to get saved. I'd like to ask you a quick question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You might say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure. Well, today would be a great time. How do I get saved, Pastor? Three easy steps. One, sin is the reason why God damns you to hell. So sin is the problem. So you got to go, man, God, I don't want to burn in hell. I repent as a sinner. Good. Then number two, believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. Do you know why Jesus had to go through that bloody mess? Because only his blood washes away your sin. Because remember, step number one again, sin is what sends you to hell. That's why Jesus died for you. See that? So all you have to do is believe what he did on the cross to save you. That's it. It's not, that's why, see, going to church don't save you. Getting baptized don't save you. Being a good Christian does not save you. Following Jesus does not save you. It's only believing what he did on the cross. And then step number three, all you have to do is say that. Say to God, God, I repent as a sinner. Why? Because sin will send me to hell. So all I can do is just believe. That's all I can do, Jesus. Believe what you did on the cross to save me. And that's it. All you have to do is say that. With every head bow and every eye shut, I can give you that opportunity right now. You might say, well, pastor, I don't know how to say it to God. Can you please help me out? Sure, I can help you out. I'll give you the words on how to say it. And all you have to do is repeat after me. But remember, repeating words don't save you. Remember, it's trusting, believing what Jesus did on the cross. I'm just giving you the words on how to say it, that's all. So you can say it this way, and you don't have to say it out loud either. You can just say it inside to yourself. Repeat after me, dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can save me from my sin. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please, one last time, just 60 seconds and we're all done. Thank you so much for your patience. We're almost done. If you say, Pastor, I just repeated those words after you, could you just slip up your hand real quick for me, please? No one knows who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. No one is looking around. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. All right. We're going to close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will never forget what you blessed us with. The most unhappy, the most sad thing anyone here can do, Lord, is to walk out that room and reject your promise, reject your blessing, and accept their own way of doing things. I pray that we will claim your promise and live a happy life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. 
No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me 